uh, we're going to talk about uh, navigating those teen years. But first, introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us a little bit about your... This is my wife, Sherry. Oh. <laughs> and this is my husband, Michael. And these are our two kids, Sarah and John Michael. And we have absolutely had a lot of fun having kids and raising kids. It's been amazing. Really, guys. How many of you guys have teenagers? So I, I say this now, and I didn't know this you know, when they were younger, because I always heard horror stories about teenagers. I was actually a really good teenager, though, so I really was. I really love God, and I really wanted to please Him, and it was great. But I, I, I say now, man, had I known how awesome it was to have teenagers, I mean, well, they're beyond teenager now. They're 20 and 21. But had I known, I would have had a house full of kids. It was so amazing. Just start with the teenager. Just, uh, yeah. Just well, start with a 13-year-old. Except, except it, to get wonderful teenagers, you kind of got to start Start when they're about the 13 weeks old. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so how old are they now? How, uh, Sarah, how old are you? I'm 21. 21? Yes. John Michael? I'm 29. I'm just kidding. It's 20. Just 20. <laughs> <laughs> Try to make a joke. That's what happens. Uh-huh. Just... It's a being corny. Yeah. So um, we were talking earlier, and I remember uh, we were in some state. I don't remember what state it was, but um, y'all were doing worship somewhere, and I was there for a meeting. I don't even know if it was the same meeting, but we met up. We went to lunch, and I remember they were like nine, ten years old, and it was a sad day because John Michael lost his Nintendo Game Boy. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but they parented him through the crisis. When, when you're on the road and you have kids in the van or plane with you, the Game Boy is a ministry tool. It is. <laughs> Game Boy, Nintendo helped raise our kids. Yes. There's the Bible and then there's the Game Boy. Right. So it's it's right so there. Different. Right there. Um, so I have a few questions that I want to ask you about uh, parenting and uh, uh just some of your wisdom. Uh, you've got the gray beard going on, so you can speak with wisdom and authority now. Um, but uh, I want to read a verse first. Proverbs 22, verse 6. And it's a familiar verse, especially talking about parenting. It says, train up a child in the way that he or she should go, and he or she is old, he or she will not depart from it. And so our uh, responsibility that God's entrusted us with as parents is to prepare them for what God's called them to. And, and, and we have a limited amount of time to have uh, influence and a limited amount of influence or limited amount of control to prepare them for that ultimate stage of life where we are not even necessary to a certain degree. Um, but I love the way the Amplified Bible says it. And so listen to the way the Amplified says, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a, ch- train up a child in the way that he should go teaching him to seek God's wisdom and will for his abilities and talents. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I love how it says, teach them to seek God themselves. Don't do it for them. Be an example for them. Train them how to, because we should be working ourselves out of a job. (laughs) And so um, y'all have done that. What are some of your thoughts about doing that? We grew up in a culture of... I mean, go back to my great grandfather. I mean, we have been in the church culture. And so we saw a lot of children grow up in church and kind of live off their parents' experience until they got to a certain age and then they bolted. Mm -hmm. And we were really determined we don't want that with our kids. Um, We don't want to teach them to just follow rules. We want their heart. We want to really connect with them. And so um, we were learning the whole time and still are. And I think that's one thing about life is there's you're never not learning how to navigate where you are in life. But thank God for the Holy Spirit that teaches us. And so um, God was really gracious to us to help us see how to meet that goal and how to um, not just not just teach them to do what's right, but to want to do what's right, because they understood the kingdom principle of sowing and reaping and knowing if I do this, this will produce this in my life. This will open up the doors to God's goodness in my life. And so we tried to, as opposed to the traditional thing that we learned, just do what's right and shut up. You know, I don't care if your heart's in it or not. Don't do that. Bend you know? to my will. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, it really has been beautiful. And, and, you know, just like 
all kids are different, just like with, you know, you said train, and so I thought about horses, not that you guys are horses. <laughs> but, but everybody's different, you know? And so I think that for every parent, it's different based on your kids' personalities. It's, it takes a little more time to step back and say, okay, God, what do I do in this situation? But um, I was reminded of this verse um, this week in, I think it's in Isaiah, where God's talking to the children of Israel and he said, I was ready to help, but nobody asked me. Mm. And so, you know, God's not trying to complicate anything to us. And, and I just want to encourage parents, and there were definitely these moments for us in raising them where we just felt frustrated and we did not know what to do. Well, he's an ever-present help when we, in those times, not just when it comes to spiritual things, but in those practical things, he loves to get in it with us. So I want to just encourage everybody to, to make that turn and lean on God. Ask God for help, and he'll give it. I just wanted to say, John Michael at one point said it was time for a training session. He said, but I don't want to be trained anymore. <laughs> he had kind of reached his limit. But honestly, you know, I read a book early, early on called uh, Families Where Grace is in Place. And it was monumental in me because raising kids, teenagers, all that can be messy. It's it's not a perfect thing. And so if you're looking for perfect, you're not gonna you're not gonna hit it. But you've got to have the grace of God. And what grace looks like is he he, he empowers you as the parent and empowers them as the kid to be able to navigate those years. If you are intentional, I mean. It, you know, you've heard the, thing, the saying, if you want disciplined kids, you have to be disciplined parents. Mm. And, and so Ouch. it takes being intentional and being on purpose. And, and I remember those times where it was like, oh, I just would just kind of don't want to pay attention to it. But really, you can't procrastinate on parenting <laughs> or, you know, there will be trouble when they get to be teenagers. And so making that investment when they're young is essential. And, um, but I was just going to say, if you're already at that place where, um, you have teenagers and maybe you didn't know the Lord or you didn't know these things that we're talking about, it's okay. It's not too late because if you go after the heart and a lot of times that looks more like a conversation, like, Hey buddy, how you doing? What's going on? Like digging to get them talking and get them to open up because if a child is shut down, just giving them some form of discipline, will make that door stay closed even more. So you got to dig, ask the Holy Spirit, and get the door open. Once you can get the door open, then you can talk to them. And we always told the kids, guys, y'all aren't like, there's one day we're not going to be around. When you get to be teenagers, we're not going to be around. So what we want you guys to do is, is develop a relationship with the Lord yourself so that your heart is always wanting to please Him. And if you're doing that and it's not, you know, well, can I do this or can't I do this? If you're thinking, Lord, it does this please you at a young age, then when they get to be teenagers and we weren't around, see, they still made the right choices because that was already developed between them and the Lord. You mentioned that um, you read a book yes. and, and got gained that insight. Yes. And, and so I've got a couple of books right here. Um, and I don't know, these are possibly ones that y'all have seen or uh, looked at before. Um, but especially when it comes to parenting, uh, Dr. Kevin Lehman, he is phenomenal when it comes to parenting. Um, this is a DVD and it is How to Have a New Kid by Friday. It is How to Change, uh, how to change Your Child's Attitude, Behavior, and Character in Five Days days. And so who needs this? Who, who would like this uh, DVD? <laughs> who would like this? Um, here you go. Uh, Misty, you can have this, y'all. Give it up for Misty. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, there's also this uh, book from uh, Henry Cloud, John Townsend, Boundaries with Kids. Um, this is such a powerful principle where uh, oftentimes as parents, you don't know how uh, you should structure things so that kids don't like rule the house and run over you, but yet you don't want to be this mean, overbearing parent. And where do you find that balance? Man, this book sets out some great wisdom on how to do that. Who would like this uh, book right here? Michelle, come on up here. Michelle, y'all give it up for Michelle. We get this book right here. Yeah, yeah, no, man, you're going to set it straight. Um, and so uh, then there's, uh, let's see, uh, women's devotional book, right, from James Dobson. 
Yeah, uh, this is great. Uh, this is actually for couples. Um, there's one in parenting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's do this That's book. Who likes to read? Who likes to read? This is Have a New Kid by Friday. It's the DVD, but this is the, the book of it, the book of it, any, mini, miny, mo. Um, uh, Amy, here you go, Amy. Come on, come on. Uh, Jesse, come up and get it for your wife. Come on, come on. Y'all get it up for Jesse and Amy. There you go. You're awesome. Um, hey, we're going to leave the rest of these out at the info desk, and um, whoever grabs these, take them. Uh, there are some other books up at the info desk. That belong to us. They belong to us, and you can, still read them. you can look at them, but you can't take them. Okay? <laughs> and uh, actually, those books are phenomenal about sex. How, as a parent, to teach that to your kids. And it's a whole series starting at the age three. That shocks most people. The first book is three to five years old. I am so thankful that when our kids were like four and five, we ordered that series and started walking through that book at the appropriate age. Uh, each one goes through different blocks and, and builds on itself. Absolutely amazing. And in the culture we live in, parents in your household, if you're not setting the standard for that, someone is. And it's not a good standard. And so as parents, you cannot start early enough to explain that. You think, oh, when they're 12, I'm going to have the talk. That's the worst idea ever. That, that is a failing idea. And so I'm passionate about this because so many lives are messed up because this isn't taken care of in the house like it should be. And, and so you've got to uh, be on top of that. And so you can look at those books, take pictures of it, write it down, but you can't take them. <laughs> they, those are ours, okay? And, and so, but uh, that, that's uh, some great that's advice That's good. You know, you. the enemy starts is starting younger and younger yeah. um, to have influence over kids. So I'm glad you guys are making that available. Yeah, and and uh, the, as parents, we have to uh, uh, be the watchman at the gate. We have to uh, uh, be, take that authority position in our house to, to uh, set that standard in a, a positive, life-affirming way. And uh, the sooner we do that, the better. So you're not trying to repair things and correct things. Um, we, we just oh, a little bit off topic a little bit, but um, uh, for Angela and I, it challenged us to address those issues when they were younger. I was uncomfortable. Like what the books talk about, I'm like, are you kidding me? This is like 14, not seven. But the book says this, and I was like, okay, we're going to go through it. And I'm so glad we did the first couple of times going through it with the kids. And seriously, about every three, four, five months, we'd go through the same book because kids need that repetition. And, and, but now, because it talks about what it talks about and the way it talks about I'm so glad we did that before middle school because then when other kids in middle school start going, hey, do you know what, blah, 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 Cole's like, yeah, I've known that for like five years, man. It's like, and plus you're wrong, you know? And so, and so it's so good starting that off and setting that standard. Um, but I do have a, a, a question that uh, I want to ask. Um, you mentioned about setting them up so that they have their own relationship with God so that when you're not around, they can hear from God and they can follow God. I have this theory that um, I'm hoping works out in our parenting, and that is that when the kids are younger, you as a parent have absolute supreme control. <laughs> when you give them the bottle, you know, whether you put them in their crib or in the bed with you, whatever, I mean, those are all choices you're making. Now, they can whine and cry about it or whatever, um, and you can give into that and start giving them control. But ultimately, you are, as a parent, ultimate control. You get to say so. But that doesn't last very long. And as year by year goes on, your control diminishes. And they start to stand up making their own choices, becoming an individual, their own likes and desires, personalities start coming through, which may differ from yours. And you want to go to Taco Bell and they want barbecue or whatever. And so all of these things in life start, start like, wait, I want my way. And that's not a bad thing. But most parents don't know how to navigate that as they see their children starting to be more individual. How do you transition, this is the question, from being supreme controller to, at best, an influencer? It's a process, uh, again, just being sensitive to the Holy Spirit of when to make those changes. When a baby's a baby, you can say, don't touch that, it will burn you. And that makes sense. But as time goes on, and thank God for Sherry, because she really helped me with this in our approach to our kids, is we just didn't want to have the, just don't do that because I said so mentality. We wanted to help them develop the ability to make 
decisions on their own that were good decisions. So um, I remember John Michael wanted a cookie one time, and she, he asked if he could have another cookie. And, Sherry, and things as simple as that, Sherry would say, well, how many cookies have you had? Instead of just no. How many cookies have you had? I don't know, eight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you think that you should have another one? You know the effect that sugar has on your body, dinner's in an hour. Do you think that would be a good decision? And so, you know, even with something, what do you think the Holy Spirit's saying? Mm-hmm. Now, it sounds silly to say, ask the creator of the universe if you should have a cookie. But they learned in those little things. They learned to make good decisions. And you have to create margin for that with them because sometimes that's not going to go the way that you think that it, yeah. that it might. But something you said earlier, babe, you were talking about um, perfection. Like we are kind of redefining what perfection means for us. Um, perfection is not just perfect behavior. It's leaning into God, always leaning into God because you have successes and you have what seem to be failures at times, but it's always a win if they ha- are learning to lean into God. And I think that that's their, their heart now is, and in a moment you can do that. Let's just lean into God in this situation. And um, um, the point for us at this stage is connection. It's all about what's going to create the connection between us and them that are going to, it's going to keep us in that place of influence with them. It's a challenge yeah. because even though they're grown ups now, you still want to like snuggle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like they're still your baby. Uh-huh. So. so let me ask uh, the two of y'all um, in the, along those same lines, um, were there times that you can remember facing a situation or an issue and knowing you could get away with something and they wouldn't find out? but saying, no, this isn't my parents' faith, I believe it. And it's a personal issue with y'all. Do y'all point out any of those times? Yeah, for sure. Um, just going back, to, <laughs> going back to, you know, what they were saying about heart connection and making sure that they didn't just have our behaviors in line, but they actually had our heart, you know? I think what that modeled for me and what that modeled for Sarah was like Jesus is that same way. You know, he's after our heart. And if he gets our heart and we, we submit our hearts to God, then all of, our, all of our behaviors fall perfectly in line. But whenever whenever my heart started connect to connect with God because of the example that they set, you know, then I started reading in the Bible and finding out like, oh, wait a minute, like God, he wants me to be successful, but there's like a way to be successful, you know, that lines up with the Bible. And I make it a practice every day to read a Proverbs every single day for, you know, the day of the month. And so I'm reading in there and, you know, you find out, oh, this is the consequences for like immorality. This is the consequences for this. This is the consequences for that. And what they would tell us is like, you know, there's consequences. There's a law of like, you reap what you sow. Like, what are the seeds you're sowing, you know? Um, but all that to say, whenever, whenever it shifted from like my parents' faith to my faith, I actually had a heart to, I wanted to actually please God, not with just like my words, but I wanted to please him with my behavior. So because of this relationship they've steered with us, now I've started to steer that and we steered that with the Holy Spirit. So there'll be those times whenever we, you know, we feel like, yeah, we could get away with something. If anybody has a phone and you're alone in a room, any kid my age and younger can get away with anything, you know, but the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts and says no it's not right and because we're submitted to the holy spirit we're like oh man that's not right and that hurts my conscience that hurts this relationship we have because it wasn't so much like you know do this do this do this we had the reason this is why this is why we want you to succeed we want you to prosper in life we want you to be able to experience the success but this is how you do it the law of you reap what you sow and so for us that was a big deal just how they stewarded that with us and how we began to steward that with the Holy Spirit. Because it's not just about behavior, it's about the heart. That's good. Yeah, basically. <laughs> second, I second everything um, he just said. But yeah, too, um, they would never, like he was saying, just answer a question um, that we might have like, yeah, well, that's just wrong or that's just right. They would always give us a why and 
even like look in scripture with us, like this is why, this is what God's word says. And it wasn't just them saying yes or no, right or wrong. It was like we knew where it was coming from. You know, guys, we literally, even when these guys were young, like if we were coming up to making a decision, like when we left Texas and we were moving to Nashville, we didn't just say to the kids, hey, guys, guess what? We're moving to Nashville. Sorry, you're moving away from your cousins and your friends. It's just life. We didn't tell them. We said, guys, we want y'all to come and pray with us about something the Lord's been dealing with our heart about. They're like uh, five, five, five and six, I think. And uh, we literally, I hope this doesn't sound weird, we pray in the closet, but we, call, we pulled them into the closet with this, and we said, we're praying, and we want you guys to pray with us and just know, what is God saying? So we said to them, you know, are we, we're asking God, are we supposed to sell our house and move? If we are, where are we supposed to move? These are the kind of questions that we're asking before the Lord. And so <clears throat> they, we would pray in the, in the spirit for a little bit. And one of them would say, I, I think Jesus is saying to my heart, we are supposed to sell the house. Now, listen, we didn't tell them what we were doing. We let them hear. We were there with them, praying with them, helping them learn how to hear God for them. And so they said, and then another one was like, yeah, yeah, I think that's what Jesus is saying to my heart too. Next thing I said, well, where, where, where do you think he's saying for us to move? You know, what do you say? And so we named off a few, few places that we've been. We've been to this place. We've been to that place. I mean, should we just sell our house here and move to someplace here in the neighborhood, you know, or closer to your cousins or, you know, what? So we would pray. We pray for a few more minutes, pray in the Holy Spirit for a few more minutes. And one of them, one of them said, I think Jesus is saying we're supposed to move to Nashville. We were like, okay, we're all hearing the same thing. And the next thing, no, the other one said, I think we're supposed to, I think that's what Jesus was telling my heart too. We said, well, let's pray about the timing. I said, because guys, if we move to Nashville, it's a long way. That means we're leaving cousins, we're leaving, you know, so we took them through the process. And actually, this is a funny part. They said, one of them, we said, when we asked about the time timing, one of them said, I think Jesus is telling, saying to my heart, March. And the other one said, I think Jesus told me April. So it's like, well, leave and, one. And, and Michael and I didn't know a timing. So we we're like, maybe we'll just hear through the kids, you know, <laughs> like, come on, Jesus, speak to them and tell us that we can know. And so we said, well, let's just, since God didn't give us a year, let's not attach it to a year. Let's just pray on it. One of you believes March. One of you believes April. Let's just pray on it. The Lord will always reveal what he's saying. So fast forward, it's like a year, a year, this was January, so it's a year and three months, or sorry, end of the year, uh, December, we sold our house, and um, so a year practically has gone by, and we were moving to, we were moving to Nashville, the house that we were getting in Nashville, the the lady said, uh, we are moving out, we'll be out by March, and so we were like, wow, well, one of them really heard from God on that, you know? And so then she called back and she said, well, it's going to be middle of March. Okay, it's going to be the, towards the end of March. Okay, well, it's going to be March 31st. And we were like, okay, March 31st works. And so we literally drove to Nashville with all of our stuff in one truck. Not, not all of our stuff in one truck, sorry. We drove one truck to Nashville. We... Um, I'm sorry, I'm making this too long. We this is really good, guys. You've got to hear it. It's going this. somewhere. It's going it's, somewhere. It's so good. And so we get there. We pull up. It's March 31st at like 4 in the afternoon. Michael is already committed back in Texas. So we literally have like 20 minutes. He opens the back of the truck. He takes one mattress, one mattress that we had put at the back, throws it on the floor in the house. We rush him to the airport. He literally called the airport and says, I'm coming, I'm coming. He got there 15 minutes before the flight departed. They held the airplane. They were like, okay, if you're here before the door closed, Southwest. we'll Southwest. Rocket. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll wait on you. He gets on the flight, goes back. So me and the kids move in March 31st. But guess what? Michael comes along April 7th with the rest of our stuff. And he moves in. We moved in March and April. Mm -hmm. So my point is, kids really can hear from God if we give them the opportunity. If, if we don't just say, do it this way or this is the way it's going to be. If we pull them into all those life decisions, part it's, it's part of the development. Pull them into the decisions that God's talking to you about. 
And then when they get to be teenagers, see, that's already been cultivated, and they know. They know how to hear. Sorry. No, that's good. Thank you. Uh, One of the things, y'all, that Angela and I have tried to do for a long time, it's probably because our parents modeled that for us, is that um, I think that Cole and Addison ought to submit to my authority because, or our authority, because we're submitted to authority above us. And we've always modeled that for them, that uh, the, and especially kids, even in an innocent way, will say, why do I have to obey you? <laughs> you know, it's like, why do you, that's your opinion, I have a different opinion, why can't I do what I want to do? And that's an honest question as they're growing up. Uh, and so we've taken every opportunity, teachable moment when that is, and we say, listen, God's smarter than me, yeah. and God put me here before you to be your parent, for a reason. And I don't know why, but I'm going to submit to that. And, and he's called me to do this. And, and so always pointing them back to higher, some, something higher than me. It's not because I'm stronger than you and can make you. It's not because I can take away enough privileges to break your will to do it the way I want. It's greater than that. It has nothing to do with that. It's about the fact that we're underneath this umbrella, this authority of God, and we're submitted to it. And so all of us are going to submit to that. And when you paint it like that, that's going to help them have that connection with God through you at the appropriate marks in their age so that ultimately they can develop into who they are and be under that authority automatically just because that's the way they've lived their whole life. And so whether they're living at home or at college or whatever, or, you know, at school, at middle school, uh, you know, in the gym room or whatever is going to be, I'm under the authority of God, not just my parents. So it's not about whether or not my parents find out God's watching, and I have this responsibility with God. And so that's one of the things we've tried to model yeah. and, and try to do for a long time. Mm-hmm. Anything you need to correct me about? No, oh, okay. I don't need to correct you about. No, but I love that way you were saying about, um, you know, how it's, it's that relationship that you have with your kids and pulling them into a lot of these decisions and stuff, especially because, they're, I mean, they're watching. They're watching yes. everything that we do. Yes. Um, a couple, I don't know, it was probably a couple months ago, my son was in, still in judo, and we had actually, um, well, he was supposed to pick up Cole, and I was shuttling her from her chair, different things. Well, I got a call from Cole because Jesse had thought to pick him up. And so she and I were Dad win. to her. Dad yes. win. It happens, you know. Okay, well, so... So, you know, I'm, I'm on the phone with Cole, you know, got that figured out. So we're t- making, you know, complete change of plans, going to pick him up. And Addison just looks at me and she said, are you mad at dad? And I said, well, you know, you know, stuff like that happens, you know, and it's, but it's those opportunities yeah. taking time to create those opportunities for our kids to learn from, right. you know, stuff that we just go through, but we have to pull them into that yeah. um, and to be able to train them so that they can, you know, have the right marriage or the right, you know, heart. I, I think a big part of it is allowing them, this is going to sound crazy, but it's worked for us, allow them to see you fail and what you do, how you remedy that, like what you do. For instance, <clears throat> Let's say you were really mad at Jesse, Pastor Jesse. That's never happened That's before, never by happened. the way. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Where you're like, if you did get some of my lesson, why didn't he get the coupon? One thing, one thing he was supposed to do, and he didn't get the, you know. But, you know, if you have that moment, it's okay to then say, you know what, I, guys, I'm sorry. That was not the right response. Mm-hmm. And so I want to ask you to forgive me because I wasn't honoring you know, my husband or vice versa or however it is. And so it's okay. And even in parenting, guys, I mean, you've not done it until you've Mm -hmm. done it, you know? And so we're on the learning curve. And so we're growing, we're all growing together. And there's been countless times we've gone to the kids and apologized to them for the way that we dealt with them because maybe we didn't do it the right way or whatever. And I think them seeing those vulnerable moments are great because see if they never see those failings then they all they see is my parents are perfect Mm -hmm. i'm trying to be perfect but we all know (laughs) we're not there no Mm -mm. yeah i I have lost count how many times i've apologized to colton addison and and here's the thing as parents and i've told parents that i'm uh, that you know different issues and i'm like just apologize to them. Tell them you're sorry. Yeah. But, but no, I need to be a person of authority. They need to see me as an authority figure. I'm like, 
Dude, you're diminishing your authority right now if you can't take ownership or responsibility. That, that, that's putting cracks in your authority. But when you can be a confident, secure person saying, listen, uh, I messed up right here. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have been angry. I, you know, I, I shouldn't have grounded you for four years. Um, uh, that was an overreaction. <laughs> you know, and, and say, let's make it two days, you know, or whatever. Uh, uh, but, but owning that is huge for uh, 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 kids or teens, uh, children, to be able to see that. I think that, that, and we're learning this more and more, that, that vulnerability really builds intimacy when you're able to, and even with God, when they get to see us be vulnerable with God, like when we got in the closet, it's not like the pressure was on us. We were putting the pressure on God. Mm-hmm. We were making ourselves vulnerable with God and with them. And yeah. then when you apologize and go to your kids, they see you being vulnerable with God and with them, and it, it builds intimacy, that connection that we're all looking for. That's good. Literally, seriously, like just the other day, right, Sarah? I There was a moment, something happened, and I just melted in the moment, and I'm just crying. And <laughs> But Sarah, I mean, because she's lived with this and she's seen it, she was like, Mommy, it's good. God's going to take care of it. And she then, in turn, gave me back words. And I was like, I know, you're right. This is right. But it was okay. I didn't have to be like, excuse me a minute while I go brush my teeth or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that she, she couldn't <laughs> so she couldn't see me. It's okay. And I think, I know growing up for me, um, my, I, my parents are amazing. They were amazing raising me. I think they did a great job. I thought we had the best family in the world. I seriously thought that my whole life. But I, as I got older, I did see that um, what was modeled was, was something that looked perfect. So then I had an expectation when I got married, and, and I didn't understand, like, whoa, why isn't this perfect? You know, so I would just encourage you, it's okay if it's not perfect. Be vulnerable connect, have that intimacy. Go I, was, I was just going to say, like, it's funny how I think every parent wants their kids to be vulnerable and open, but not a lot of parents will be vulnerable and open themselves. And it's just, it's just that very thing of like, you know, we, we're, we're, mo- we're always modeling something. Like our lives are being shaped after something or someone that we're, you know, putting our uh, attention on. The Bible actually says that what we worship, what we, what we admire, what, do we, what we set our affections on will actually control all that we are. I love actually the Passion Translation uh, says that in scripture that guard the affections of your heart because out of those, it controls everything about your life. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's so good. But like we're modeling them, but if they never choose to be open and vulnerable, even though it's hard, I'm sure many times you're just like one to like one minute you know, go somewhere else so that you can't see, you know, then we're never going to be open and vulnerable with them, you know. So in a conclusion, um, with people that are, uh, have preteens or teens, that is kind of a fractured relationship. It is a hard struggle in, in many households. Um, what are some advice that you would give to say, to address some of that or turn some of that around? Um, humility is just the greatest it's so powerful. It's the simple things that God uses to elevate us in life. And I think just humbling yourself and, and a conversation with a team that of saying, I know there's tension here. I don't want there to be that tension. I know some of it's my fault. I want to fix it. That those simple words open up the door to, um, the connection that we're that you're looking for as a parent let's figure this out together because i love you and i want the best for you and so if we can really just get the heart of god i i, I love the redemptive nature of god it is never too late for anybody i don't care mm-hmm. where you're at what's happened it, god can redeem it in a moment i love the title of that book i haven't seen it a new child in mm-hmm. five days yeah i totally believe that that can happen i think it can happen in one moment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think that god can use simple things like humility honesty vulnerability the things that are built into us that that are hard sometimes to cross that line and and move forward with but if you'll take that step it really they are all components of faith faith requires vulnerability faith requires stepping out and those those are not big spectacular things but just sitting down and being humble and 
opening up that door that can that can make the change. And one one last thing Th that is awesome, honey. But from a spiritual component, let the Lord give you a couple of scriptures, two or three scriptures. Print it out, insert their names, and you and your spouse get in a get in a place of agreement and pray that over your kids. You know every day, all day, multiple times a day, and let the word work. That's because the word does work. Yeah. Instant yeah. results from yeah. finding God's word to us for our kids, mm -hmm. inserting their names and praying it, I mean, in days, just yeah. see a shift. Yeah, especially uh, preteen and teens, um, the Holy Spirit does a much better job convicting and correcting <laughs> than a parent. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and because it's about the heart and the kid can manipulate a situation where the behavior changes, but the heart doesn't. Right. Yeah. And, and that's a, a short term. I, fix. I think that's the big danger is, you know, the, the greatest gift God gave us was the gift of free will. Yeah. And so to try to control someone else's will. And so when we're we're coming out of that kid thing into that adult thing. Well, you don't want to try to control mm -hmm. them. God doesn't try to control us. And so that's a part of. Giving that to God, yeah. trusting Him, yeah, for sure. And letting them make mistakes, yeah. and then letting them feel the consequences yeah. of those mistakes, too. Um, and so swooping in and minimizing the consequences, yeah. let them own it. That's the way they learn. And I'd much rather them make those mistakes and feel the consequences at 13, 14 than at 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. Those are different set of circumstances. So let them start earlier and, and feel what a you know, uh, hungry stomach feels like if they skip the meal or let them, let them, uh, stay up too late and then feel horrible the next day. And don't be mad and angry with them. Just saying, Hey, what could you do different next time? You know? Um, but, uh, let's pray. Uh, if y'all would, would you pray over uh, parents and families that are here today as we sure. close? Lord, we just, um, God, first of all, thank you so much for, for family. God, it's, yeah. I'm thankful that you gave us something so precious. You, created us as your family and now you let us live that dynamic out here on the earth lord and and uh, i just pray right now over all the parents all the kids in this room god that you would give us a revelation of what your original intent was for us as families god and we just we open up the doors of our hearts to grow in that and to fully become all that you've created us to be god i thank you for every grace that is needed to parent every grace that is needed to to maybe humble ourselves and apologize and fix things not just for the parents but for the kids for the teens as well god i thank you that your grace is all the power that we need lord and and it's so amazing to me that it's free <laughs> and so i just speak grace grace to the mountains that are represented in this room and the things that have been difficult and have been hard. God, I thank you that your light is breaking through in, an, in areas that have been dreary and cloudy. Lord, the sun's coming up and shining and bringing life and light into those situations in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, as we're closing, I want to uh, leave us with this scripture. Uh, it's in Deuteronomy 11, 18 and 19. Um, man, let these words speak to you as a parent, as families. And, and even uh, if you've got adult children out of the house, uh, th this is still such a vital uh, truth that's in Scripture. It says, so commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Parents, man, let's take ownership of it. Let's commit to it. Let, let's not let culture raise our kids. Not, uh, you know, let the schools take care of that. No, you're in charge of that. Commit to it as a parent wholeheartedly. It says, tie them around your hands, wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Let it be a lifestyle. Yeah. It's not, well, the, for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, we're going to go do the God thing, but then go home and do whatever we want. No, let it be a lifestyle where every part of you, as a parent, you're surrendered and submitted to the authority of God. And that just sets the course for the whole family. And man, if we commit to that, then we can start seeing God move in great ways in our family. Not do it in our own strength, we do it in God's strength, and he, there, he's, there's so much grace there. We're going to mess up as parents, but when we're submitted to him, there's so much grace there that uh, God can fix any situation. So, man, we love you all. Thank you all so much for being here today. Welcome, and thank the uh, Howell family for being here.